Okay, I think we're gonna get started. So hi, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, this is pre-evaluation in Ruby. Uh, my name's Kevin Dice. I'm at KD Dice on the internet. You can follow me on Twitter. Please follow me on Twitter. I give terrible hot takes on new Ruby stuff. Um, I work at a company called Culture HQ that is a small uh, person, three-person company in Boston. We're, focused on improving culture in the workplace. If you're interested in improving the culture of your workplace, you should come talk to me. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna start off with a warning. This is a very technical talk, uh, but that is not meant to scare you. The, the function of me here is to relay this information without completely blowing anything out of the water or um, alienating anyone. So if you are an absolute beginner, I, I hope that you will find value in this talk regardless of the technical content. So if, you know, this is difficult stuff, so it should be somewhat difficult to understand, but if you labor without any uh, value at the end, then I have officially failed. So if you have any questions, again, come talk to me afterward. Um, so first, we're gonna talk about compilers. Uh, Ruby, specifically Ruby's compiler and the various steps that it takes, and then we're going to talk about extending that compilation process and the value that we can derive from that extension. So when we talk about compilers, we typically we talk about a couple of steps. First, there's the lexical analysis step, then semantic analysis, uh, instruction generation for the virtual machine, that was new starting in 1.9, uh, various optimization passes, and we're gonna talk a lot about that. So if we're gonna talk about lexical analysis, what we mean is taking a sentence, like this sentence, Matt's is nice, so we are nice. I know there's supposed to be an and in there, but eight fits nicer on a slide. So anyway, um, so lexical analysis is taking this kind of sentence and breaking it up into individual tokens that we can then apply a grammar. So if we're gonna look at this, we have to split it up here. We have our individual tokens. This is just splitting on white space for now. And we need to understand this. We need to understand what parts of speech these things are. Right? This is still the process that other programming languages will go through, but for our purposes, we're writing an English language compiler. This is what your brain is doing in your head. So, okay, we have nouns. We understand that that conceptually is a noun. Is is the to be verb. Nice is an adjective. So is a conjunction and so on and so forth, we have a period to end it out. So these are our tokens. Okay, great, so we've gotten this far, and this is a little bit like regex. I mean, we, we, semantically we understand that like, this is kind of what we're looking at. We're breaking things up into patterns. Semantic analysis is the process of taking those kinds of tokens, applying a grammar, and deriving some kind of semantic meaning from those individual tokens. So if we're gonna look at this, let's, let's just take the the verb and the adjective. What we need is a name for this section. We need, we need a name, so we're gonna call it a verb phrase, and the pattern is just gonna be verb adjective. And so if we go, okay, now we have a verb phrase, and we have these two little trees, and we can say, okay, that's a verb phrase, that's a verb phrase. Now if we go and we add mats and we, we have nouns, and so we need a name for this kind of thing as well. And so we can go into our grammar and extend it and say, okay, let's have a noun and then a verb phrase is gonna be called a subject phrase. Now, here's a little disclaimer. I don't actually remember very much about grammar at all. I have no idea what a subject, an object, a subject of object, I don't know any of those things, but this is what we're gonna call it for this part of the, of the talk. So this is a subject phrase, great. We've got two subject phrases. So then we add a so in the middle. I had to look this one up. Turns out that is called a subordinating conjunction. Uh, also, someone came up to me after my last time I gave this talk and told me that's actually an adverb. I don't care. You're still gonna get the <laughs> I just don't care. That's not the purpose of this talk. So thank you very much. Um, and so we add it, we have a subordinating conjunction. Great, okay. The last token we have is a period. We're gonna say, okay, for the purposes of our grammar, a sentence is always a subordinated conjunction, say that three times fast, and then a period. 
Great. We have a sentence. And if you look at this, this is a tree. It's relatively abstract, and it represents syntax. So we're going to, just off the top of my head, call that an abstract syntax tree. <laughs> Amazing. Great, so we have an AST. We have derived this from plain text. We've gotten tokens. We've applied our grammar. And you see that this is very similar to what is already being done in a lot of places in the world, in our apps, in our code. This is an example from Rack, which is a recursive descent something something parser thing that Ruby, that Ruby uses. And this is an example of a calculator. Right? We have various expressions. On the left side, you have an expression. On the right side, you have an expression. You have a plus in the middle. That creates another expression where you add the two values together. This kind of grammar is also used inside of Ruby in parse.y. This is what is used to generate the parser that generates the semantic analysis for us to understand our Ruby programs. This is also the part that does the arithmetic. So great, so we've, we've used our grammar to generate an abstract syntax tree. We need to walk that tree and generate instructions for the virtual machine. So we have our tree. And what we need to do is all of those blue nodes all of those blue nodes that, that aren't the light blue, the dark blue nodes, all those dark blue nodes represent something that we're doing. We are, we are doing something within our virtual machine to manipulate the state. So if we look at just the bottom, just the verb phrases, what we're really doing is we're pushing an attribute. This is all going to be very not scientific. <laughs> Doesn't actually make any sense, but it's okay. We're pushing an attribute. That dollar sign two is meant, meant to represent the second item of that little pattern. We're pushing an attribute onto the stack. Great. OK. For our subject phrases, we're going to say, OK, we're going to save an attribute onto that noun, but put, pop the attribute that we just pushed onto the stack. OK, so we're saying for the verb adjective is nice. Now we have nice as an adjective, and we know we need to apply that to something. When we get up to the subject, uh, phrase, we're going to pop that off and apply it to the noun. So we have Matt's nice. Matt's is nice. Great. Okay. Now we have our subordinating conjunction. I just love saying that word. Uh, this is basically an if statement, right? If you, if you really think about that, that's, this is an if statement. This is saying the right side is only true if the left side is true. Great. So we're if statements in in uh, virtual machine instructions often are represented by jumps, right? You, you put a label somewhere, you jump, you skip over some instructions if something doesn't resolve the true. So we're gonna say we're gonna conditionally skip a couple of steps. Great. Finally, we have our period and we're just gonna say, okay, we're gonna trace the execution of that sentence and we're good to go. We have generated our machine instructions and we're gonna do that just by walking the tree, okay? We start to eliminate things from the tree this is all very not scientific at all. It's totally fine. And we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna pretend that this is like pseudocode for our virtual machine. Right, I mean, you understand that I'm writing a compiler for English, this is not real. But, <laughs> but that's okay, okay. So we have our instructions, great. Let's optimize those instructions. Now you might say that there are no optimizations that are available here. Technically, our grammar could support us saying Matt's is not nice. But we know Matt's is nice. <laughs> we know he is. He's a nice guy. We're just basically saying the sky is blue, right? I mean, like, what we're really saying is this is a constant part of, of the virtual machine. This is a constant part of the set of instructions. And although, yes, technically the grammar could support us saying Matt's is not nice, we know he is. And so we're just going to eliminate that and move it up. Great. We've eliminated dead code or unnecessary checks or whatever it is that you want to call it, and we have fewer lines to execute. Our code is more efficient. Everyone is happy. We are nice. That is what remains after you take away the left side of that statement. All right, great. So let's look at Ruby. Let's look at Ruby, let's look at what happens. Okay, if five plus three is eight, then puts hello world. You would think this is always true. And for the most part, you are correct. <laughs> if we go and we look at the instructions that are generated for this, we see a whole bunch of stuff. Now let's look at what this is doing. This is putting five onto the stack. 
then it's putting three onto the stack, then it's you know, adding them together, and that's great. I can tell you right now that will always be eight. I can also tell you I'm lying. Uh, so if you're not too familiar, five plus three in Ruby breaks down to five, send the method plus with whatever is on the right side. So let's just call that eight for now. And if we go further along, we can also see opt equal. Okay, eight is always eight, so let's just put true. And if we look at the code, that's what this breaks down to. And so if true, we, we, we can always just get rid of that if statement entirely and just put hello world. Except when someone tweets something like this. And then someone writes this. And now we're evaling stuff off of Twitter, so you know we've really gone to the dark side. <laughs> But you know, now what happens is when you put five plus three, you get two. All because I decided to tweet. <laughs> now, the thing is, we have to go back to our code and it's like, oh, God, of course, because the grammar technically supports overriding that method. So, okay, so I guess we'll go back here and we'll, we'll, we'll do this deopt thing. Deopt, deoptimization. It's a fancy word of, way of saying, Okay, well technically this is this value, but if someone does something stupid, then we need to go take care of it again. Damn. And so we have, an, we have that instruction, but I don't want that instruction in there. That's the problem. So the real question I want people to be asking is why would you ever do this? <laughs> That's the dumb, like who does, okay. So raise your hand, raise your hand. If you have ever purposefully Monkey patched an arithmetic operator on a core class in a production application. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. And the thing is, we are dumbing down our compiler. We are, as a community, dumbing down our compiler to support this use case. We are not making this optimization because technically, someone could be stupid <laughs> and do that. So I wrote a gem, it's called preval. And preval is a little gem that assumes you're not stupid. <laughs> so, okay, so what we're gonna do, we're going to go through that same process wherein we derive semantic meaning from a string in Ruby, and then we're gonna do a couple more things before we send it back to Ruby. So, Ripper is a baked-in library to Ruby. It ships. You all have it. You can require a Ripper. And Ripper will give you the abstract syntax tree, which is great. First two steps are taken care of for us. We get this. It's a bunch of arrays. And we're going to do stuff to arrays. That's what we're doing today. So if we go into preval source, this is kind of a dumbed-down version. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to loop over all of the different types of nodes and we're going to build our own nodes that we can then manipulate. We descend from um, sex builder, S expression builder, has some basis in computer science. I don't know, these things. Uh, and then we, we loop over each of the events, we define a method that will handle them, and we create a whole bunch of nodes. Great, so we got our node classes. We go into nodes, and what we need is a way to go from abstract syntax tree. We have a way to go from source to abstract, abstract syntax tree. We need a way to go back to source. We need a way to go back to source. So we have this to source method, um, and we define this module format, which is just a little bit of code. Um, basically takes every single possible node type in Ruby and converts it back. This is not, rel this is not new. Um, this has been done before. Um, it was done in the gem sorcerer, which I found like literally a couple hours ago. <laughs> um, back in like, I think it was 1.8. And then, but this idea of transforming abstract syntax trees is not new, right? People have been doing this back into source for a long time for formatters, auto formatters specifically. Uh, if you look at prettier, um, and this is where I tell you that I'm incredibly biased because I wrote the Ruby plugin for prettier, but it does the same thing. It takes an abstract syntax tree, converts it into an intermediate uh, representation, and then prints it out. The thing is, this is not prettier Ruby. This is uglier Ruby. If you look at this, it's horrendous. It's actually really fun. Um, basically, uh, everything is uh, hash rockets, which makes me cry. 
And you know, it, there's parentheses all over the place in spaces. You would never want to look at it, but it doesn't actually matter because all we're doing is we're passing this back to Ruby. No human ever actually sees this part. Now, in order to really go into this process, what we're going to do is we're going to parse that source parser is just, as I showed you earlier, just descends from Ripper. And what we're going to do is just loop through all of the different visitors that we build to go and manipulate that abstract syntax tree before we convert it back to source. And so all we have as a public API is preval.process. We're just processing a string. And again, we're just going through that same process that we did right at the beginning of taking a string of whatever, applying lexical analysis to get our tokens, applying semantic analysis to get our tree, manipulating the tree through optimizations and passing it back to Ruby. So if you're within the node, this is what we're really doing. We're visiting each of those nodes and we can build a visitor that does something like this, as simple as this. If the left side is an integer and the right side is an integer, we can just go ahead and do that. We're going to assume, we're going to operate under the assumption that people aren't going to be monkey patching things they shouldn't be monkey patching anyway. I did actually have someone raise their hand like two times ago when I gave this talk. And I was like, why would you do that? They're like, I don't know, it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just ashamed. And you know what, I'm okay shaming those people. I really am. I just don't mind so much. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a quick demo. Um, there is a small rack application uh, built into the uh, gem. So, oh, look, you can see it and everything. Um, so if we just have something like um, a equals one, it just prints out A equals one, which is great. And what's funny is that like even if you do this, right, indentation is totally not understood. It doesn't matter. Again, no one's actually looking at this. Now the thing is, technically, if you have an adder reader, which is a method that is named after the instance variable that it is returning, it is more efficient to call adder reader than it is to explicitly define this method. So it's just gonna do that. It's just gonna do that automatically. Now technically, technically, someone could have monkey patched the adder reader method. I don't care about those people. <laughs> I just don't. Now, technically, if you have a value here, you can see it lost the adder reader because it wasn't an adder reader anymore. And you set it equal to value two, then it's gonna maintain it. But if you set it equal to value one, this is technically an adder writer. On the left side is, let me just get rid of that uh, A equals one. On the left side is the code that you are writing. On the right side is the code that your Ruby sees. And this is more efficient. This is better. And this is doing it without a senior dev yelling at you in a PR. <laughs> Even better. There are certain other things you can do, like while true, technically loop do is more efficient. I don't actually know why. Um, I don't actually care. Um, and while false, just goes away. Nothing's ever gonna get executed, so it doesn't matter. You can do the same thing with until, and until true. Wrapping your head around double negatives just hurts me. And obviously there are plenty of other things baked in. The real magic of this gem is how you use it. Technically there's only one part of the uh, public API that really does the magic, it's process, preval.process. But if you happen to be using Bootsnap, which you all are using if you've, boot, if you've uh, run Rails new since Rails 5 or if you just decided to use Bootsnap, um, Bootsnap is a gem that actually will look at the code that you're going to be executing and go ahead and generate that, those machine instructions and write them out to a file to speed up your boot time. Well, you can do terrible things to Bootsnap. <laughs> you can monkey patch their input to storage method and run stuff through uh, checking if Bootsnap is available and just, instead of just compiling, you can just process the stuff before it actually does anything. Um, all this to say is you're lying to Bootsnap, but Bootsnap doesn't care. Uh, what is method privacy anyway? Uh, so the, I, I just wanted to enable everything, but I felt a little badly, so I did add one thing. 
Every one of these visitors you have to opt into. Technically, if you start running Prevail on your production application today, then it will do absolutely nothing. You need to go and explicitly tell it to opt into all of these different things. And the reason you have to do this is because technically, you could be doing something dumb. I lied earlier, I will support that, as dumb as it is. And, but if you go and enable all these things, then you are opting into that, um, that uh, volatility, shall we say. And so, okay, so this is the current list of what Prevail does. Uh, you don't actually need to be able to read all that, but basically it will take care of arithmetic expressions, arithmetic identities, it will take care of the adder accessors. It has some various things from the faster gem, which is a static analysis tool that will tell you when certain things are faster depending on the Ruby version. And it also do a couple things with loops. <laughs> Did you know there's a for loop in Ruby? <laughs> Technically there is. Don't use it. Um, right. So really, these optimizations break down into three different categories. There are optimizations that can be done now. And in my opinion, they're very safe. No one's going to monkey patch the adder accessor method. If you do, God help you. But there, in instruction elimination, I don't really see a way to make while false ever execute anything, short of a C extension. I just don't see how that's possible. So these are things that could be done today. Preval contains those kinds of optimizations. It also contains optimizations that can be done with the optimization. And if you look at MJIT, there are, the uh, Ruby just-in-time compiler came in Ruby 2.6, there are deoptimization techniques being used. And so Ruby is doing some of these things. Um, a for loop replacement could be done with the optimization wherein it just gets replaced with dot each, but if dot each gets monkey patched, then it falls back to for loops. Constant folding, as in three plus four, uh, could be done with the optimization. It actually is done with the optimization with the Ruby JIT. And then there are certain things that the compiler can never do, that we can operate under certain assumptions and then work with. A compiler is never going to replace certain APIs with newer or faster APIs. A compiler shouldn't do that. That would be very scary if a compiler did that, because that is inherently unsafe. Uh, the, the compiler can't possibly have enough, enough context about your application to know whether or not it is safe to make that optimization. But we, as developers, have the capacity to build optimizations like this for our own applications that speed up runtime, that reduce memory, and are good for our applications that the compiler doesn't even have to see. It doesn't even have to worry about it. So this is the question I get. But why? Why would you do this? Um, and, and the obvious, I mean, the obvious answer is performance, right? But I'll tell you right now, <laughs> I'll tell you right now, I uh, put this into, into production, um, only temporarily shut down my service. Um, and I did put it into production because I wanted to be able to say it's in production, and it is, it's running in production, great. It didn't improve performance at all. <laughs> That's not the virtue of this gem. I'm gonna tell you the virtue of this gem. If we look at code style, code style as in like the source of most arguments, um, we start out with absolutely nothing. Code just proliferates and we have people getting angry at each other, leaving work early because of RuboCop, right? It just happens. <laughs> <laughs> and then people are like, oh, God. We have a way we do code here. Our way is the best way. So then we have senior devs enforcing code in code review. What's funny about this progression that I'm running through, I have been in a company that went through this entire progression. And let me tell you, it just gets better as you go. Senior devs enforcing code review, that's terrible. Okay, the reason that's terrible, senior devs have to read every single line of code that goes out. That's awful. No, don't do that. I don't wanna have to review code. I want to be able to mentor and program. That's all I wanna do. Okay, so the senior devs get together, they decide a style guide is gonna be developed. Okay, great, there's a Ruby style guide, it exists, it's on the repo for RuboCop. Fine, we have a style guide. We don't have to agree as a community, but the thing is, if we just go by the style guide, it eliminates a lot of arguments. Okay, good. Okay, 
style guide is in place, that's great, but it's still being enforced, so linters are developed, and they're run locally and hopefully in CI. That's all well and good, but do you know the amount of time I have to sit and wait for bundle exec RuboCop? The amount of time in my life, it pains me to think about that. It hurts. I, I run it locally and it makes me sad. <laughs> and you know, Marie Kondo has taught me, it doesn't spark joy. A and so the final step of this in my understanding of the style progression are auto formatters and compilers. Fundamentally, if I express an idea in speech, in English, Matt's is nice, so we are nice. Or if I say, how y'all doing? How y'all doing? There is slang in there. Technically, according to Oxford English Dictionary, I have not spoken with correct English. Yet somehow, some magical way, all of your brains are able to comprehend what I am getting across. Fundamentally, it doesn't matter how I express myself if A, I haven't offended, and B, you understand what I am saying. It's 2019, our programming languages should be able to understand multiple ways of speech and still come out on top. I don't want to have to sit and wait for a linter to tell me that, you know, loop do is very, very tiny, slightly more efficient than while true. I don't want to sit and wait for that. I don't care. The compiler should be able to handle that for me. I shouldn't have to think about the way I express myself as long as my idea is getting across. So we're here. We haven't gotten as a community down to the bottom step. There are other languages that do get further than us, especially if you look at other implementations of Ruby. Truffle Ruby has a lot of stuff based on the Grawl VM, based on all kinds of stuff. MRI, we have not quite gotten there. And I can show you based on the Travis.yml in my repository. What is that? What that is is six different static analysis tools. That's horrendous. And I wrote it. I chose this. I chose this life. Why? I hate it. I hate it really. OK, that bundle audit, that should be taken care of. The Ruby language should be able to take care of that. RuboCop, no. No, 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 an auto formatter should take care of the style rules, the performance rules should be taken care of by a compiler. Bin Rails Reek, same thing, Breakman, the security vulnerabilities should be taken care of by different APIs being chosen by the compiler, or an auto formatter just changing the, the method entirely, or just an error being raised. Bin Rails faster, same thing. I just want to test my code, and I just want to deploy my code. So if we look back at this style progression, let's think of a world where this is the reality. Auto formatters and compilers, they just take care of it. They just take care of that and we're all good. At the end of the day, what this means is that you are going to write your code. You're going to test your code. And then you're going to deploy your code. You're not going to run six different static analysis tools. It doesn't fundamentally matter the way in which you express your code. First of all, all the micro op optimization that we've been obsessing over as a community, you know those don't matter in your app. I'm sorry, but they just don't. Fundamentally, most of the time we're running a micro optimization and we actually care about it, it's within a framework, it's within Rails. There are hotspots in Rails that need to be micro optimized. Very, very few applications actually need that level of optimization. More often than not, your sales process is more broken than your for loop. At the end of the day, I just want to write Ruby code. I don't want to have to obsess about the multiple steps that I have to take in order to get my code out in order to somehow avoid a conversation with another developer because they like parentheses. So, uh, so yeah, Preval is ready for use. Um, you can use it in production. I promise it won't take down your application. The nice thing about the approach is that there is zero runtime performance loss, right? This is all done at compile time. When Rails, is, or sorry, when Ruby is, out, is compiling your code, there is a step between the time that it generates the abstract syntax tree and the time when it is executing that code. That time is before startup. Your application isn't slowed down by this. This isn't doing anything live in production. This is just doing things locally. And with that, that is everything I got. Thank you very much.
I had like three cups of coffee, so I went really fast, turns out. So if anyone has any questions, I have plenty of time. <laughs> right, right, yes. Yeah, so the question was, um, can the gem validate that its transformations are safe? And it's funny, I was about halfway through writing that validation code when I realized the integer is monkey patched by Rails. <laughs> and I realized, uh-oh, <laughs> that won't work. Turns out that Rails monkey patches integer uh, for date adding and stuff like that. Actually, monkey patches a lot of stuff. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and run without validations for this, but I'll accept a PR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there a way to reformat the, uh, the compiled code back into source? Yes, there is. Um, except I hate that. <laughs> um, the reason I hate that is because the entire virtue of this gem is allowing you to express Ruby code in multiple ways without being forced into one specific way of expressing it. Um, so. Yes, you totally can, but honestly, at that point, I would just point you to rubocop dash dash fix, <laughs> or auto format, or whatever the argument actually is. Yeah, the question is, can you add your own extensions? You absolutely can, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's in the documentation. It, you just uh, define a class that has any on underscore and then the node type, and then you do whatever you like. <laughs> so you can really shoot yourself in the foot. Any other questions? Great, well I will be available for any questions afterward. Thank you very much for coming.